much larger conversation was about hypertonicity of the pelvic floor within the pediatric population. Okay, this will also um, speak to constipation, actually, which is a large issue for those of you in the pediatric world, so this may be relevant to your practice. Um, so the question, and Melanie, I don't know if you can retype it. Michelle. Oh, it was Michelle, I'm sorry. Um, is, uh, is was something along the lines, do I see, or do, do we know of a hypertonic pelvic floor uh, situation in um, the pediatric population. Um, let me just say that I doubt that we have any really, really concrete evidence in that regard because of the, the inability to do internal exams um, as a research tool with, um, with pediatric patients. That's the, people are reluctant to do that. Not that there isn't meaning or there isn't reason to do that in some cases, um, but generally speaking, again, you guys know this, it's hard to do pediatric patient, uh, pediatric research. So I'm going to be speaking theoretically um, about this, and uh, but understand we have to, I do say this a lot, we have to back up the truck and we have to look at that term hypertonicity. Um, hypertonicity in this world, speaking to pediatric therapists, means something different to a women's health physical therapist, okay? So, so we have to kind of, like, let's unpack that word a little bit in terms of tone. Um, and I'm going to turn to Shelly. Welcome to this is actually how this works, okay? We're going to have conversations with Shelly and Julie. Okay, so can you have a hypertonic diaphragm? Well, I don't see why not. As, right. As so let's, we're talking about this in terms of pediatric tone, spasticity, right? But whenever you have an opportunity for neurological input, you have the opportunity for the possibility of increased uh, neurological activity feeding the diaphragm. Right. Um, so yes, it's, it's hypothetically possible. Right. Absolutely. So theoretically, you could potentially also have that kind of tone maybe in um, the, the pelvic floor. But then, I don't know, could you also have tone in the detrusor, which is the bladder muscle? We see overactive bladder. So again, I know that that question, I'm guessing, was not related to pediatric spasticity, neurological type tone. Right. But, um, but I am... Um, but I am trying to begin to work with um, folks in the neurological community. Um, I, so a little something fell off the radar when I went on a, my hiatus in terms of working with folks that are doing uh, multiple sclerosis type um, research. Okay, so so I'm not sure what exactly that means in terms of tone and spasticity, like that kind of an issue. Um, and again, I don't know how much information we have about that. There's so many things to research, and people are just starting to explore all of these kinds of topics with um, our pelvic floor and with continence. Um, I think we're finally allowing it to not be so shameful and just recognize that this affects a lot of people and a lot of populations. The problem with things like a neurological problem like MS or Parkinson's or any of those things is that continence is kind of like the last thing. <laughs> like you have so many other things to deal with. Same with you guys in your kind of in your world. Continence isn't always at the forefront, right? So, um, but it's but it's but when we understand continence as a piece of stability and balance and all that kind of stuff, we might see a shift in that, and I hope so. I hope that conversations like this will help us start to think that way. And as clinicians, we are in charge of, of giving researchers stuff to, to investigate. So, so these are great questions. Now, so that I'm going to leave that piece, but I'm going to link it to a women's health understanding of hypertonicity. Okay? The, <laughs> this is what an after party is like <laughs> with Shelly and Julie. Okay, is, is that one of the things that Shelly talked about with, when she talked about tone and spasticity was what is true spasticity? What is stiffness that comes alongside that? And then what is that dynamic holding? Okay, so when we move into talking about a hypertonic pelvic floor in the women's health world, um, I think that we we kind of are overusing that terminology. This is me being quite frank, okay? And I've blogged about this, so I, um, I haven't hidden behind anything in this regard. Is that by saying it's hypertonic, understanding it from the perspective of spasticity and all that kind of stuff, um, I think that that's an overused term. And there's sort of an assumption that's been made in the women's health world, particularly as it relates to athletics and athletes, is that people are, it, what I like to say is they're over-recruiting it. 
Okay, that's to me that's a very different idea. Okay, so they're over recruiting it as a stability strategy that's faulty. Okay, and just like we saw when you guys changed your breathing strategy, muscle physiology has said to us, you should, it takes six to eight weeks to stretch out a muscle. Okay, you should not have been able to train your, change your breathing pattern if that was totally true and that was true muscle stiffness, high tone. Okay, if it was just being over recruited and you change the pattern of recruitment, you're gonna relax that situation. Does that make sense? Okay, so so when so we've made a lot of assumptions about that these women are just plain old hypertonic, um, and because they're athletes, and be, and so so understand that I really think of that as over recruitment, that that's a faulty stability strategy, just like breath holding, okay, just like gripping your abs. Hang on, you're saying something and I'm missing it. Sorry, I'm just saying that it, it's 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 that that conversation. Uh, I'm up into the frame. Uh, that conversation about uh, just being so careful with our language when you use the word hypertonus. I mean, that has a, a connotation that there is uh, an increased um, information and a and a, a, a change in the input neurologically to that muscle from the uh, either damage in the more in the motor cortex or somewhere along the way in the central nervous system. So that's a very different thing, and and that's a, also a very different thing to try and impact in terms of how would you treat that versus you saying that it's an over recruitment strategy which again has a whole different connotation to how do you impact that um, from an intervention standpoint. Right, well and let me just link it back one more step to one of the, the other pieces of the conversation with Shelley regarding spasticity is I like to call it dynamic holding. Okay, it is because they don't have a better strategy that's what they're utilizing. So it really, so the question then is, well then how do you intervene is that we understand why exactly what we've asked you to do here this weekend, which is how are they compensating and then why are they compensating that way, okay? And so for a lot of our women that do have an over recruitment pattern problem, we might, one of the things that we see with them is things like constipation. Does that sound familiar? Okay, they're holding, actively, sorry, subconsciously, they're holding. So they've got things like that puborectalis that won't relax so that they can let go of their poops. But maybe they're doing that because they're fixing at the diaphragm and holding their breath for every, every functional activity that they're doing. They are just like 12 year old, tall, low tone children. I'm not kidding you, okay? And so they're holding their breath and guess what? The system is set up that the pelvic floor responds to high pressure from above, it prepares for it. So that's what they do every time they get out of a chair, every time they take a dish out of the dishwasher, every time they pick up a pencil, it's these huge amounts of force that are coming from above, the tummy and the pelvic floor are fighting it, okay? And so is that the problem? Then we need to change their strategy related to their breathing. And is their breathing, or sorry, their stability strategy take them out of breath holding? And are they breath holding because they're standing in a position that doesn't give them access to the rest of the system? See what I mean? Like you gotta really back up the truck. We also understand anxiety is a part of it for a lot of women. We do have a study, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to quote that the research, I, I, this was in a conversation with a, a fellow women's health practitioner who treats pelvic pain, but apparently we have a study that shows that one of the first reactions to a stressful situation for women is to grip their pelvic floor. So if you have someone, so listen, if you have someone who has an anxious state, like maybe the little girl who had ASD that we were looking at, she has an anxious state going on all the time and she's also constipated, hmm. You know, is she breath holding then? Is she doing breaths like this? You know what I mean? And so if we, we can nail both of those problems by teaching them umbrella breaths and pistons because what we're asking them to do is take an, an, a parasympathetic, um, a breath that enhances the parasympathetic system, calming down the anxiety, but we're also asking them to inhale and lower that pelvic floor before they create any challenge on top of it. Okay, so we're actually asking them to, we don't ask our patients to start from a already contracted position and then make it 
more and more and more more over recruited we actually make them always start from an inhale so that and we try to teach them control I'm not asking you I'm asking you right now to stand up against gravity you should not have to grip your abs to stand up against gravity that's what I tell my patients all the time if I'm asking you to pick up your teaching partner and carry her limp exhausted body back into your house you better believe I want those beans up and you got to use that pelvic floor big, okay? But if you're just standing around, we should not have to grip our abs to pull that off. And guess what? The pelvic floor is going to fight that. So, so again, these com this is such a big conversation, um, but I think we have, we have a lot of ideas that we need to sort of flush out with, you know, we need to not look at one piece of this puzzle. We have to see the whole puzzle and begin to use our clinical decision making in order to help us start to suss out where do we begin. I'm telling you, I just begin at the same spot. I always go back to the center. I always go back to alignment and breathing. Okay, just always take them back there, start there, and then start to build on it. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I think uh, that is, uh, I hope that answered that question, um, but in, in terms of your population, constipation is a big deal, and I'm telling you, this is a great strategy to help them start to relax. You can hum on the potty, you can relax them on the potty, take your time, take some really deep breaths, change up their GI motility throughout their day, and, and you're going to start to impact that. And guess what? Constipation in pediatrics is a huge part of continence issues in pediatrics, okay? It's a part of adult too, but adults seem to know how better to handle them.